And welcome to the ANU National Security College. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight. My name is Nicola Rosenblum and I'm the Deputy Head of the National Security College. Um, this evening I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd like to uh, welcome here this evening member, senior members of the national security community. Thank you for coming. Also those who are studying or have studied at the college or who have participated uh, in our courses. Um, uh, some of, we also have some of our national intelligence community NSC scholarships. And of course, I'd very much like to acknowledge uh, Kate, Simon and the friends this evening who have joined us. Thank you so much for coming. And of course, NSC staff who, who are putting on this wonderful event this evening. So this evening we have brought you here to hear from Paul Simon, the Director General of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, in conversation with Professor Rory Medcalf, head of the ANU National Security College. It's not often we get to hear from a Director General of ACES, um, and of course Paul also has a very distinguished career uh, in the military and intelligence more broadly, so he'll have a lot of different reflections that he can draw on. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions towards the end, um, and refreshments will be served again at the conclusion of the event, back outside the door. <laughs> um, the event this evening is being recorded. Um, and so in terms of social media, um, if you'd like to acknowledge that you are on, on, the, on social media, that you are here at the event this evening, please go ahead. But we would ask you to refrain from posting anything on social media about the content until after the recording has actually gone public and we've had a chance to check that we're happy with the content. Um, <laughs> Of course, can everyone please just quickly for me check that your phone is on silent or switched off? Um, and I'll now hand over to Professor Rory Medcalf. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicola. And uh, again, I would um, echo that, that warm welcome and uh, the, the acknowledgement of country as well. And this is a real privilege. Uh, so I was just reflecting, uh, Paul, that you've been in the public eye a few times this year. Um, it is, of course, fitting, uh, as you all know, that it's Halloween and it's when the, the spooks come out. Uh, I just had to throw that in, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, better in here than, than uh, out on those, uh, those wet Canberra streets at the moment. But, but seriously, Paul, you've, you've uh, made a number of statements in the last year or two that really, I think, speak to the, the increased um, transparency of our intelligence community. You've obviously had reasons for doing that. I know you, uh, you spoke, I think, I think, at the Lowy Institute earlier this year. You've also done, over the years, a number of interviews and conversations in the public eye of the kind that once upon a time it was pretty inconceivable that a Director General of ASIS would do. So I guess just to begin with, why, why come out of the shadows? I know that this is a certain stage in your career where perhaps you feel a tiny bit more um, uh, at liberty to do that, but there's clearly a purpose. Why? Rory, uh, well, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation. And I guess we're going to pretend like we're sitting at a dinner table talking to each other. And fireside. fireside. Yeah, fireside. Yeah. And uh, I'll try and keep that camera out of my peripheral vision uh, as I try and answer your dinner questions. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and, and, as you, and to those that have uh, come here tonight, thank you very much for coming. And my, if your view of Halloween is like mine, it probably wasn't a bad excuse to get, a, get out of home and not have to deal with the challenges of Halloween. But it, it is a great pleasure to be here. And um, I think that the, uh, the incentive and the motive to, um, to talk um, in a, I think, sensible, as best I can make sensible and calibrated way, is to address a couple of issues. I think if you, if you look through the now 70-year history of uh, ASIS and you Google ASIS, um, then a big part of its uh, profile um, is born of problems, you know, issues, dramas, uh, uh, controversies that go back decades. And, of course, you can't undo um, those sort of, um, you know, situations. You can't undo your history. But the history is so unbalanced. Um, and it's, it seemed to me when I came to ASIS in, uh, in 2015 um, that I, as I saw the calibre of the people, as I, as, I, as I worked my way through the history of the organisation, um, I was very concerned that, uh, that we ought to... Well, I was concerned that it, we were getting a very skewed view 
of the service and obviously in a very competitive market where like the other agencies and, and I acknowledge the agency heads that are here and the deputies that are here but you know it is a competitive market and we as a community you know have a story to tell and I think it's a pretty positive story. The second issue I think is one of um, the moment that we are living in and by that I mean uh, the uh, in my view, we are at a critical juncture in national security and uh, because of the geopolitical situation, uh, the challenges are, are growing, not decreasing. And interestingly enough, when you're in an organisation like mine and you think about, well, what are the, what are the vulnerabilities that you have uh, in a world where there's misinformation, disinformation and the like, social licence and this idea of a Director General um, speaking to the broader public or those that are, are curious, those that want to know, um, I think is um, that it merits um, increasingly, carefully, um, changing the way in which uh, the organisation is viewed. If, if the situation gets declines further, it's not inconceivable that for an agency like ours, if you didn't do something about social licence, if you didn't give the public a sense of what type of people you are, you know, are you are you maverick? Are you uh, are you rogue? You know, what what type of organisation? Given there's so much fiction out there, then it's not beyond the uh, your imagination that actually uh, an adversary intelligence service and all intelligence services are adversaries in a way that you could use misinformation, disinformation and dislocate us at a moment when we least need it as a nation. So in other words, if you haven't built that social licence, if you haven't built some understanding of the type of um, the role that we have, the, uh, the work that we do, the type of people that we are, the type of people we need, um, then I could envisage a day where it could actually be used against us. So, I, you know, I think, I think I'm um, keen to, over time, see the service... Um, gain more and more of a profile. Of all of the intelligence agencies, it's probably the one that least um, should be hungry for a profile. Um, Rachel, Mike Burgess, Andrew Shearer, they have a, uh, a, a genuine public education um, responsibility given the nature of the work that they do, whether it be you know, in the cyber uh, world, whether it be in security like Mike does, or you know, Andrew who, who um, you know, fundamentally um, informs business and the public about a whole range of things. Um, you know, I think they, they should always have a higher profile. But no profile for ACES is a problem too. And part of this was proving to some of my people that it is possible. You can have a proper conversation um, you can give people a sense of the type, you know, organi uh, the type of organisation is, the type of people we are, um, and you're actually not divulging uh, any any great secrets. And of course, what I'm going to do now is ask you some very personal questions to get you really comfortable, and then we'll come back to the topic of ACES. And who knows? In all those years of um, all those years of tradecraft, uh, probably a bit hard to overcome. But I think that's a that's that's a really useful. Um, articulation of, 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 of the logic of what you're doing and I think there are many of us in the public debate who would encourage this. I think it's been very refreshing if I may say. But let's now talk a little more about the service uh, and then move on to your own career and uh, this particular phase that you're at now but um, how do you see as the evolving purpose of ASIS, the mission of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, uh, because not every middle power, uh, not every country of our size, necessarily has this capability, this kind of service that's that's all about uh, foreign human intelligence. So, just tell us a little bit about what's the point of ACES. Well, I think I mean the fundamental point about ACES is that human agency matters. I mean, uh, humans make a difference and. Um, intelligence is the business of understanding uh, a human agency and the calculations that, uh, that humans make, whether they be political leaders, economic leaders or whatever. So there is always a need, you know, we're a social, social animal and, and um, you know, there is this concept of human agency that, that really does matter. So overall, um, you know, that's why 
um, I would argue, uh, human intelligence uh, is really important. The, the three areas that we um, that, that is built into the sort of DNA of ASIS um, haven't changed that much, but um, the priority and the apportionment of resources um, will will change over time in many ways dependent on the government itself, the government's priorities and the risk appetite of government. Um, and, you know, the sort of um, mission that we have, the scope of activities that we have um, is, 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 is uh, directly related to the risk settings of government and what government wants from us. Three main areas, uh, obtaining secret intelligence, um, uh, acknowledging that human agency matters it matters in the affairs of state, it matters in the national interest, uh, and all countries are acting in their national interest. So it's our job to try and help the government know and understand uh, and build relationships with uh, agents, as we uh, know them as, those people who are willing to uh, be ultimately directed and controlled by us and answer the questions um, that we're seeking to answer for government. So that's that's the first issue. And so the need for secret intelligence and the reports that we write, you know, that's been really ever since the 13th of May 1952 when we were created, we've always been doing that. Um, the audience changes. It's very wide. So, you know, in, the, in a COVID crisis, all of a sudden agencies that you wouldn't normally see as a core customer uh, of us um, had a very strong desire to better know and understand, especially countries in the region, of what was really going on, whether what was being said publicly uh, was grounded in truth. Um, and so, you know, we have to evolve and adjust to um, the circumstances, but that's the, the secret intelligence. Um, intelligence diplomacy is a, is a second area that we engage, and it's not just ASIS. Um, all of us in the intelligence community undertake... Uh, intelligence diplomacy, but it's this concept of, you know, uh, political leaders will talk to political leaders, diplomats will talk to diplomats. What is unique, I think, about intelligence chiefs talking to intelligence chiefs is that um, normally uh, nations are more than... Uh, it, it suits nations to, in many ways, um, you know, neither confirm nor deny that certain conversa sensitive conversations have been... Uh, underway, or, um, or you know, we'll just say that you know we're not going to talk about you know a, a particular, a particular relationship or a particular meeting. So, so it is true that uh, a, an agency like ASIS can undertake intelligence d diplomacy both with nation states and state actors, um, but also with non-state actors and with the authority of the minister, the foreign minister. Um, there are a number of non-state actors that it's fundamentally in Australia's national interest that we have a conversation with, uh, with those uh, senior leaders, and it's and it's often me or you know one of the intelligence chiefs that will, you know, open that line of communication depending on what the issue is. So that's the second area, and the third area is really in this, in the Intelligence Services Act, uh, ASIS has this quite unique, I think. Uh, uh, function in Section 6 of the Intelligence Services Act, which effectively says that um, within the scope of, you know, political, economic, military activity offshore in the foreign intelligence, at the direction of government, you can undertake activities at the direction of government. So that's where we really step into the sort of activities where Australians overseas find themselves in peril uh, and need to be brought home. Uh, in situations where uh, ASIS is used to uh, penetrate, uh, you know, people smuggling syndicates or the like, again, in the national interest. So undertake high-risk activities where uh, we're acquiring intelligence but we might also take that intelligence and disrupt offshore uh, at the direction of government. So. It's a it's a pretty broad scope, actually, of the things that we can do, and it comes back to sort of what I was saying about the government. Government's risk appetite and settings uh, change over time. Its settings in the you know 50s, 60s, and 70s are very different to what they are right now. The demand pressures on ASIS, frankly, are very, very high, uh, and that's just simply a reflection of the of the times we live in. The skill set. The skill set this requires, though, I mean, we'll come to this at the end. I want to come back to the workforce issue at the end. Uh, but 
there's not necessarily one size fits all for all of those activities. So have you seen the the demand change for the, for the skill of, uh, you know, I hate to use the word average because I'm sure there are no average uh, ASIS officers, but, but the skill set for your officers, has it changed substantially in recent years? Um, well, firstly, the type of person we need, um, if you set aside the so some subject matter experts, you know, so data engineers, data scientists, those types of people, then um, many of the people that we need, um, the criteria hasn't actually changed that much, Rory. I mean, th th they need, <clears throat> as a foundation, a solid IQ and they need a solid education. Um, they need a really solid rec recollection, memory. We, we help train them a memory and accuracy of language is really, really important. So, so a, you know, sort of a high IQ is assumed. It's the EQ piece in our business because it is... It is taking, you know, it is human agency, it is human relationships, it's building trusting relationships with people who are undertaking some perilous uh, risks to themselves that we've got to build that level of confidence. So good people skills um, uh, becomes an important ingredient. So, I mean, what am I seeing? Well, I'm seeing probably like everybody, the generation coming through, the digital literacy is already much higher than, you know, our generation. So that's a, that's a great start. Uh, frankly, uh, and I know Rachel's really, you know, recruiting very, very hard and, and the numbers have been quoted that, you know, are showing an interest in ASD. It, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, the, there, are, there are a lot of very intelligent people that are hungry to get a, a really good job, whether it's in ASD or ASUS and the like. So, um, th there, is, um, there is plenty of talent there. The literacy, the digital literacy really helps. Um, but it is also true that uh, we need certain people with those sort of generalist, you know, high IQ, EQ, and then we will uh, superimpose on them people with very, very specific specialist skills, you know, when or how we need them for particular activities. Yeah, I was going to say it must be an incredibly rare combination to some, someone who has all of that, especially with the, the technical skills that may be demanded now for some of the intelligence work that, that, that is a hybrid of um, human and signals intelligence. Uh, can I ask about uh, recruitment, though, in that sense? I mean, what are your recruitment options to find those very special people that you need? Um, and given that the intelligence community as a whole and the national security community as a whole is also on a, um, you know, a, a, a recruitment drive, needs to be to meet those challenging strategic circumstances, where do you find those people? Are there avenues that are about building a a national security or intelligence career across agencies rather than just with ASIS? What do you do? Well, I think this is a body of work that uh, we've been working on. Um, and, you know, Andrew, uh, you know, and I has been sort of uh, leading the way here in, you know, very much seeing ourselves as a community. Um, and as long as people rec recognise that having joined the community, some people will have a better predisposition, you know, because of their personality or their characters to, to anyone, you know, of, of the agencies or maybe a number of the agencies. Um, but we should be really clear about this. Um, it's, a, it's a very rare individual that can swim through all of the different agencies. I mean, they're very different you know, qualities um, and levels of expertise that we need, you know, in the various organisations. So there are similarities, but I think it's within our gift and I think that's what we're trying to design at the moment is the community very much as a community, uh, harnessing our, I guess, our collective uh, touch points with the public or with business or the like, um, improving the knowledge and understanding of who we are and what we do, um, and then we take it from there and we can manage that, I think, inside the community. But... You know, for anyone who is interested in national security and is at school now or at university or the like, because of the strategic circumstances we find ourselves in and because of the sort of programs that you have here at ANU and, you know, various institutions around, the, around Australia, the sheer demand on the intelligence agencies, and I would say probably defence more broadly and we'll wait to see the, the Smith... Houston review and, and its outcomes, but it's just hard to see the trajectory of being anything other than this is a growth industry and we need good people and it's a great career. You know, and I can say that after 42 years, it is a fantastic career, incredibly demanding, um, but uh, what, a, what a special community to be part of. So um, it, it's, it's, you can now, you can now, through a portal into the sort of the community, we can, we can help work with people 
and point them in the right direction depending on the sort of skills they have. Thank you, Paul. Let's talk about your career and I think it's no, it, it's no secret that um, you're on the verge of a, a transition, if you like, and I think uh, you'll, be, you know, you'll be sorely missed in your uh, retirement very soon, but I'm sure we'll be seeing you somewhere in the, um, the national security landscape. Um, the world's changed a lot during your career. Your career's evolved and, of course, we know began as a military career and you reached the rank of Major General, Deputy Chief of Army, Director of DIO uh, before you moved across the lake. Um, you know, did you imagine that your career would lead to this point and are there any um, reflections you can make on that, on that journey? Uh, well, I certainly didn't think that I'd be Director General ASA, so I can say that unequivocally, uh, Rory. Um, the, so I, I graduated uh, with my good friend in the front row in, uh, in 1982 and the interesting thing about 1982 um, was it was the year of the Falklands War and for me uh, at 21 years of age uh, I was deeply interested in the Falklands War. It was very distant but a very serious war and uh, I talk about human agency, well, you know, I reflect back on this now, but if you look at the calculations that General Galtieri made at the time and you look at the calculations that Margaret Thatcher made and the calculations that the First Sea Lord made at the time, I mean, humans matter. And that's why human intelligence is such a, an important discipline and any, um, I think any serious country dealing with national security issues needs to have a, a, a human intelligence agency. That was the environment that we walked into and in fact the year after I graduated uh, as a bit of a, a relief for the, the Brits who had fought over in the Falklands, uh, the, the battery that I was, I was in artillery as was Paul and um, uh, my battery, bad luck Paul, yours wasn't, mine was sent across to the UK to work with 2-9 Commando Regiment who had fought in the Falklands War so they had literally just come off very, very difficult uh, uh, operations and you know, what, what struck me about that, I've sort of thought about subsequently for our generation, is that through the 80s and the 90s and certainly through the 80s and 90s, the, the link between, if you like, grand strategy, strategy, operational concepts and tactics um, in an Australian context, there was a, a certain imbalance, a certain dissonance that I lived through and I think my generation lived through um, some of the um, some of the doctrine made imminent sense at the strategic level but frankly for those of us at the tactical level that were trying to master you know tactics uh, or realize operational concepts there was a there was a bit of a gap a bit of a, a dissonance and I think for Australia for a long time and our experience was that that um, that was sort of hard to get your head around, hard to, hard to fully um, align in your mind. I think what's, what's evolving um, and what's changed, and in particular, um, and again, I think this is where the Houston and Smith Review will be really uh, very informative, very instructive, and I think very um, quite cathartic, I think, for the nation is that for the first time, because of the, the challenges of the geostrategic competition that's underway, we're on the cusp of, I, I think, gaining a real alignment between grand strategy, strategy, operational concepts and tactical proficiency. And ultimately, you know, the big challenge is what, what equipment, what capabilities do we need? Um, and the priorities are getting so sharp now. Uh, I can see that the generation that are entering this world into national security um, will not be as quite as perplexed as we were with our generation because of that of that uh, alignment or lack of alignment that, that we lived through. So as, as best I can see things, um, Australia is uh, at a really at a really important turning point. Um, I think the hard questions that are going to be asked of the nation and some genuine conversations about our preparedness for conflict none of which we hope. We clearly want peace and stability in our region. There is no doubt about that. But it is our job in the national security community and the defence community uh, to present options to government and to think and prepare for worst case. And, um, and I think that's particularly stark right now and I think is 
going to be very demanding whether you are going to pursue an academic life or a pr practitioner's life or a, the life of a strategist or, li or the like. These are really, really interesting times. So this is meant to be the bit where we're talking about, about you, Paul, but you're taking us to the, the big strategic right. issues that I had coming up in my narrative. Um, look, that's, but that's really... Uh, that, that leads to a few other questions, though. I think the question of um, are we prepared as a nation for the contingencies, the crises you know, that may come. We know that there will be shocks. We just don't know exactly what or when. Maybe you do, but most of us don't. We know there will be shocks. Um, it sounds to me as if you're... And please you know, challenge me on this, but it sounds to me as if you're suggesting there is going to be a need for a, a, a more robust national conversation at some point about what we're prepared for as a nation... Uh, you know, including if, essentially mobilising in the event of, um, of crisis. Is that a reasonable observation to make? I think that um, for any nation, um, as, um, as competition, uh, as strategic circumstances shift, it's incumbent on all governments, uh, informed by officials like us, um, to lay out, um, you know, the prospects of um, of conflict. Again, peace and stability is something we all want, but it's hard not to see with the current settings uh, how we could be sort of over-prepared for conflict right now because it takes time. And I think um, the reality from my point of view is I think uh, priorities become clearer as uh, risks become greater. I think there is a, you know, a correlation I, I wouldn't want to characterise, um, and, and this is a very difficult issue for government, how to get the right balance here. History won't be kind to us if we um, are, are underprepared, uh, if we don't make the investments now. Um, but I also recognise there are another, you know, a number of other challenges on government. I think the word mobilisation you know, for the general public is... That was my word on it. Yeah, I know. And, but, but, it, but, but it can be so easily uh, construed in people's minds of where we've been and where we might go. I think that the, you know, for a country of our size, of our, our relative wealth, uh, of our education, of the sort of standards of the, the, the quality of life that we want to maintain, I do think that the country has to have a more... Uh, I think there are going to be some challenges some challenging conversations in the years to come that remind us all that if we want to preserve this, if, if um, that then it, it genuinely needs to be um, some form of um, whole of government, whole of nation effort um, that, that lays out in pretty clear terms um, the sort of risks that we face and how we should start psychologically preparing ourselves for more difficult times. So perhaps preparedness is the, <laughs> is, 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 is the word. Thank you, Paul. Look, back to you for a moment, then I do want to move to the future, uh, including for, um, for ASIS, and then I want to open to the uh, colleagues in the room for their own questions. Um, you've talked a bit about your own journey. You didn't expect to end up where you are, but, you know, he, here you are, and I think we're all very, very grateful for that. Um, were there any surprises, twists and turns along the way that you might want to share with our audience? Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the international dimension of your work. If there's anything, you know, that particularly uh, either profound or perhaps um, perhaps surprising, perhaps amusing from that side of, um, of your experience. Mm, that's a hard one. Um, so I think... Um, there are many surprises and it's the nature of our agency. You know, we are an operational agency. We're not a bureaucracy. We're not a government department. We are engineered for risk and we are agile and adaptable. So no two days are the same and I think it's one of the great joys of being in ASIS is that no two days will be the same and there will be surprises, some really, really happy ones, some that really do make, make you want to jump up and tell the nation uh, what we've done or what, what we've achieved. Um, and there are some, some tough issues as well because it's a, it's a, hot, you know, it's a risky business. Um, so uh, the, the truth is that while the organisation um, 
you know, it has processes and it has accountability and it has bureaucracy. It very deliberately uh, brings that level of process bureaucracy and accountability down to the least appropriate to the sort of work that we do so that we can focus on undertaking activities, not admiring process, not admiring bureaucracy. And that's part of the challenge as, as I think a Director General to get that, to get that right. But it does mean that it's a very flat organisation and I think one of the attributes of ours to other, um, some of our counterpart organisations, you know, foreign intelligence services that are obviously much larger, um, is that they stovepipe people and they, they, you know, they cohort people, um, they narrow their skills and then it all comes together as one great big sort of organisation. For us, the real joy is there will be surprises because you're going to be put into extraordinary situations at, at, at very short notice. Now, I have mentioned um, publicly uh, earlier in the year, you know, the, uh, the exfiltration of people that had been providing um, information to the Australian government for years uh, in Afghanistan that we needed to get out. Uh, and we take that relationship with those, um, with those agents very, very seriously. And we were determined to get those agents and their families out, and we did. And that was extraordinarily difficult because you might recall that, you know, it was around the airport and it was difficult to get out beyond the airport. But we had to get some individuals who were in great personal peril at a time when, you know, Taliban had set up 56 checkpoints, you've got to get these people through. And so when you say, are there surprises? Well, at the end of the day, um, what happens in that situation is from top to bottom, it's a very, very flat structure, but we are literally working day and night um, with each other to adjust to the circumstances in a very agile way. And were there surprises? Absolutely. But the greatest surprise of all was we got them all out and we got all our people back. And, and that was extraordinary, but that was no, that, that's no, not preordained by any means. So, yeah, we're, we're engineered for risk, but there are always surprises. And those individuals that found themselves, you know, climbing up onto the roof to get the satellite comms, the, um, the Jane that I talked about in the anecdote with uh, the Lowy Institute, you know, or the people who were talking the agents and their families through, well, look, this is how, this is how we, we, we need you. You need, to, you need to completely trust us and we will walk you through how to get safely to where we're going to meet you and then pull you onto the aircraft. I mean, it's that level of, that level of, of tactical detail that has strategic consequences in the work that we do. And these are young men and women on the ground that are doing this and I'm not interfering. I'm trying to help them in any way I can, make sure they've got the best sort of support they can, but they're on their own. And to a degree, human intelligence li is like that. You know, my background in the military, and I know I'm avoiding talking about myself, but, I, but, I, but the, the difference between, you know, the military, and I loved my military career. I mean, I absolutely adored it, and it's good for anyone, you know, as a, as a great career of 35 years. But the difference between the military and, and ASIS is when you, when you graduate and you, uh, you increase in rank, you always have... Um, you know, formations around you. If you're, you know, you've got a battalion around you or a brigade around you, but you're, and you're in a chain of command and you've got that comfort that the way the Australian Defence Force, you know, uh, practices and the way it conducts itself on operations is smart people who are very attentive to uh, the safety and security of the soldiers that are there. So you've got this incredible umbrella around you. And of course you build in responsibility to the point where, yes, you become you know, brigadier responsible for people in the Middle East or in East Timor and those sorts of things. And, you know, there's surprises every day. But you've got this incredible ecosystem that sits behind you. The sort of surprises that we uh, get involved with is, you know, individuals who are meeting with an agent in the region and there are calculations that they're making as they undertake that meeting where something looks or feels wrong and they have to make a decision and it's them alone making a decision, am I going to proceed, am I not going to proceed, am I going to turn left, am I going to turn right. Um, now obviously we train people to uh, have a very, very good sort of personal awareness of this but that's the difference, you know, there, there is some level of support that we can provide them with the great, you know, infrastructure that we've got in the intelligence community but it does boil down 
to surprises because of individual choices that people make at a very, quite a young stage in life um, that have genuine strategic implications. And some of those reports and some of those meetings they have will be on the desk of the Prime Minister. They will be on the desk of the Foreign Minister the next day. So it's, there are plenty of surprises. We will keep it on you just for one moment longer. Leadership, you will talk about this, Paul. Um, your advice to young colleagues who may be starting out, whether it's in a career in, in army or in the military, in the ADF career, in the intelligence community, the national security community, uh, are there steps along the way where perhaps you could, they, they, they could take a few shortcuts based on lessons that you've learned the hard way? Shortcuts to be effective, not shortcuts to... Right, to right. Do you know, I, I don't have any gems of wisdom. Um, I would say a couple of things. One is um, our personality, uh, our character traits, um, and I think I can say this now looking back uh, at the, you know, the age that I am, it doesn't change. The fundamentals are there. Whether you uh, care for people... Um, whether you are interested in people, whether you are aggressively ambitious. You know, some of those things are well and truly set by the time you're in, you know, year 10, year 11 and 12. And, and it is what it is. But my, my comment would be that the more you know yourself, the more you're comfortable in your own skin, um, the more that you observe others, the more that you can adapt and, and um, try and work on your strengths and, and minimise your weaknesses. And accept the fact that we all, we all do have a lot of strengths um, and we've got weaknesses as well. And I think what leadership these days um, both demands um, and seeks are, you know, they talk about genuine leadership, but people who, um, they're not trying to be someone else. So in the security world, insecurity, insecure people whose behaviour manifests, that insecurity manifests in, in any number of ways, I think can set a very bad uh, climate and culture in an organisation. So I, I have no perfect formula. All I know is um, I don't think I'm any different now than I was, you know, 50 years ago, 55 years ago. Um, I've read a lot. I've observed a lot. I've... I've come under some leaders who were quite poor and it was because of insecurity, their own insecurity, and I could work that, I could work that through in my mind. And I've worked with some excellent leaders, outstanding leaders, you know, in the military, in the intelligence community and the like. And you just pick the eyes out of it to sort of, um, in some respects, adapt your style and that's all I've ever sought to do. I think the culture in... It's, it's sort of easy to come into, into Oasis. I think it had a culture in the past that was so closed and so secretive that some of the, the light that I've tried to shine on ASIS has been partly designed to, re to have people recognise that, you know, working with sharp elbows in the community and being all secretive, that's not, the, that's not the answer actually, and I think we're doing this very well in the community, collaboration, cooperation, coordination together. You know, um, I think that is the responsible way forward. Um, I think it's really important that government uh, knows that that's the way we feel and that's the way we act. We need to remember that, uh, and this is a genuinely non-political comment, there, there is no vote in politics to give my organisation more money or Rachel's or Andrew's uh, or Chris's. There, there's no votes in it. So we have, to, we have to have proven performance. We've got to make the arguments ourselves and give government the options, but there are no votes in it. And I think, and I'll, I'll finish there because it's a long answer to your question and I'm wandering all over the place, but the, there are not only no votes in politics, but we find ourselves right now in a really interesting situation where the two major political parties are being forced almost to go against the grain in the way, the way they think about the current uh, geopolitical situation we face. If you're a liberal, small little liberal, if you look at the doctrine of Robert Menzies, it's small government. It's, it's staying out of the way of, of people, letting industry thrive, let people thrive, 
small government stay out. Um, what's going on right now, and you know, is that because of the demands on national security, then we saw with the previous Liberal government, they had no choice. They had to step into issues like Huawei. They had to step into in issues like rare earth mineral, minerals. Those sorts of interventions are quite philosophically uh, at odds with the, the philosophical underpinnings of the Liberal Party. But that's the nature of the time. And of course, uh, with the Labor Party, um, well, you know, they would much prefer to be spending their money on um, you know, childcare and health and education and a whole range of things. And as I say, there is no vote in giving us more money. So both, both governments, informed by the advice that we give them, are to a certain extent swimming against the tide. And this is why these times we really are at an inflection point. Inflection point with having the broader, I think, nation understand the level of risk that we've got without becoming alarmist, without over, over egging it, but highlighting the fact that um, uh, our risk settings are changing and the nation needs to adjust accordingly, but also our political parties are also recognising there is no turning back. The, the situation demands that some of those philosophical underpinnings um, have to be uh, subdued because responsible national security decision-making demands it. Last question from me, and then I'm going to open up to the floor, if that's all right. And I may come back with a few questions later, but I suspect I won't, because I know there'll be a huge amount of interest in what you have to say, Paul. And that actually goes to the strategic environment. How profoundly has it changed? Um, what do you see as the big risks and challenges ahead? I mean, we've seen, as, as you said, geopolitics come back to the fore. Um, we're dealing with, obviously, uh, China's behaviour in the region, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and, and the way that's evolving, and of course, um, China's actions uh, with regard to this country over the years as well. But we've also seen the use of direct military force by Russia uh, against Ukraine and everything that means for, uh, for the globe. And there are other concerns and issues too. How do you see the changes in the strategic environment and in particular, how does that affect what we're going to need in intelligence? Yeah, big questions, Rory. Um, I think let's talk a little bit about Russia-Ukraine because I think for our community, um, uh, the, the significant change um, that we've all observed is the declassification of intelligence uh, early in the conflict. Um, for which risk is involved, uh, you know, especially in, in our world, uh, and protecting the sources that we have. But that declassification of intelligence um, gave governments in Europe in particular some, you know, material advantage that allowed their publics and their governments time to distill what was going on and make some calculations about sanctions around provision of aid, whether it was lethal aid or non-lethal aid. So that's a game changer. And, and I think the provision of intelligence in that particular conflict and the use of intelligence, um, there's no turning back. I, I just don't think there's any turning back. And um, perhaps the conventional wisdom was, no, no, these are, you know, these are the deepest and dark, darkest secrets that shouldn't be declassified. But you shouldn't then um, bemoan a, a public that is struggling to come along if it hasn't been informed, if it's not been given the information that it needs, especially in a world where disinformation, misinformation is so rampant. So, so I think you know that's something that we are very, you know, very carefully and consciously thinking about at the moment. In terms of what's changed, I mean, everything's changed. If I think about, you know, my relationship, and even if I talk about it with human intelligence, with C our friendship with CIA, with the Brits, the Canadians, and the New Zealanders. We were formed in 1952. The reality is that from for, for the first 50 years of our existence, um, everything was about the Soviet Union. It was the Cold War and the Soviet Union. And in the, if you like, the uh, cascading uh, world of human intelligence, the Soviet Union was the principal concern and the batting order was really, really clear. It was, you know, in my world, CIA, Brits, Australia, I would argue maybe arguably ourselves and the Canadians. Um, we then obviously from September 11 went through a period of time where we were all focused on terrorism in the national interest and it was all hands to the pump. Now we're making the adjustments that are very much addressing 
China and um, and the prospects that we saw for China when I was director of DIO 10 years ago are very different than what we see now. And so the um, whether we like it or not and the influence of China into our region and the intelligence that we're acquiring about what China is, is the type of activities they're undertaking in the region is being shared with government and I think you're seeing in government's uh, language very much a very, you know, very strong desire about peace and stability, listening to the region, trying to support the region. Um, but in a context where you know, there is some very alarming signs. And so I think what we're going to see is um, you know, maybe for the first time ever in an organisation like mine that relative order is changing. And with that comes certain responsibilities because a lot of the, a lot of the um, uh, issues are playing into our region. And I, I could well see a situation where that relative uh, importance, the priority, the resources that are assigned to the human intelligence agencies actually reflect that the Cold War is over, that we're still managing terrorism, people smuggling, kidnapped Australians and other issues, but our primary focus is China, its behaviour, its actions, and trying to understand and reveal the gap, the delta between what's being said and what's actually happening on the ground. So we've got to be prepared for our intelligence to be globally significant, whether we like it or not, is what I'm hearing. That's uh, right. Look, thanks, Paul. Let's open it to the group. Um, and just to remind uh, colleagues in the room that we're, we are recording this. Uh, this is not going anywhere live, um, although uh, it will in due course be uh, broadcast. So um, feel free to ask any question you want, but um, I'm not going to oblige you to identify yourself. Um, and my colleague with the microphone will come to you, uh, my colleague Chelsea. So please, I'll start with this gentleman over here. Thank you. Thanks for speaking to us tonight, Paul. Um, in the significant technolog technological advancements we've seen in the past 30 years, do you think that's been beneficial or detrimental to human intelligence, a field that's traditionally been more face-to-face? -face? And how has the service adapted to those changes? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, I, 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 I think there is a... I talked about scale uh, in size of people, but there is a scale issue in technology as well, and I think we're all grappling with that scale. And if I just sort of tell a bit of the backstory, I mean, I think the backstory is that, you know, in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the intelligence community, government, R&D led the way and business followed. Um, and, and, of course, that's completely flipped now. The, the real innovation... Um, you know, lies outside government and the, the trick and, you know, this is something that we take very, very seriously is to be tapped into venture capital, to be tapped into startups, especially for an organisation like ours. We can't, we can't be caught out with some new technology that really is, is quite out there uh, and be slow to recognise it. So there's been a lot of work in the last few years inside our community to be tapped into that, that system, that ecosystem. Um, and it's it's critical. It's absolutely critical. And you know we've got we've got the touch points, but we um, but there's more work to do because we've got to be hungry um, to be innovative, um, to be tapped into all of the emerging technologies. And we just cannot be. Uh, you know, again, history won't excuse us if there's a certain technology that we've missed that exposes my people, exposes um, the sort of work that we do. So. I think it's, it's, it's in our DNA of all of the intelligence agencies that we care deeply about the development of technology. We were probably all a bit slow, but this is some years past, of, of making that recognition of the flip between government R&D and, uh, and what the outside world produces. I think there are some issues, uh, for example, government to government with ITARs and those you, you may know of, but some of these... Uh, some of these protections that were put in in a former time were fit for, an, uh, for a former time. But I, I would seriously question, given the demands that are being placed on it, whether they're truly fit for purpose for the type of work that we're going to do now and into the future. And so I think, I think we all need to be sort of hungrily thinking about are we as well tapped into emerging technology? Is government and government R&D, especially you know, in the Five Eyes relationship, as agile as it should be? And are we still holding on to some behemoths that made sense perhaps in the Cold War when government was at the cutting edge 
but is now no longer the case. And frankly, as a, as a foreign intelligence service, I can pretty well match many government capabilities that have constraints on them. In a trusted world like the Five Eyes, I can go to effectively intelligence supermarkets around the world and get the sort of capabilities I need and I don't have any of the hassle. So we just, you know, that's the way we've got to adjust. Thanks. And, and just to build on that, um, Paul, what about the, uh, you know, the, the dramatic um, improvement in the, the scale and the quality of open source intelligence in recent years? I mean, how does that affect the value add of, um, of, of your service? Oh, I mean, open source is, um, you know, is a massive game changer and has been since the advent of the internet and the like. Um, for me, um, so I, I'm conscious that a former CIA deputy director indicated that it might be time to set up another agency that's purely open source and would provide, I think she said, competition with the intelligence oh, agency. You, you've been clearly getting inside information <laughs> on, our, on our courses, Scott. <laughs> well, I, I confess, I, I agree with her about the importance of open source intelligence, but I don't agree to set it up as a separate agency in competition with, uh, with the intelligence agencies. I think cooperation, coordination, not competition is the answer. And, and maybe perhaps that's a reflection of because the US is so large, they will set up these very large agencies and operate that way. I think one of our strengths is the cooperation and coordination. And, and frankly, we need different things from open source. The demands that Andrew needs in, in uh, providing on a daily basis the best information to the Prime Minister and to the senior ministers about what's going on. Um, I guess to a degree the, the information that goes into those products could be seen as a competition between open source and intelligence agencies. I've got no problem with that. I mean Andrew has to, you know, and his people have to make that calculation about uh, what is passed on to the Prime Minister. Uh, but of course um, th that's a calculation that dismisses the fact that social media, open source, can be so easily manipulated and adjusted and it's a calculation that the team have got to make. Uh, Rachel and I and, and Chris have different needs for open source but still very, very important needs. So I've got to be able to, I've got to be able to swim in that open source world but I've got to protect with assumed identities or protect the sort of work and why I'm showing interest in, in open source for my own purposes. So that's why for me setting up a separate agency is not the answer. I think every agency will have a certain a touch point to open source, uh, uh, open source intelligence and we'll do it in a way that makes it as you know, sort of fit for purpose for what our needs are and they are different needs but we don't need to create uh, another monster. We should keep that as lean uh, and as central to our, our mission and our, our core cool purpose as, as we can. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to a few others around the room and um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll then go to uh, one of my colleagues from the National Security College. Are there any other questions from anyone in the group? I know that we have, I think, a couple of the scholarship holders from our um, Women and National Security Intelligence Scholarships. So if, if, uh, if any of you have questions, we'd be delighted to hear, to hear from you as, you as well. Um, but I'll go, I'll go to this question here in the, in the middle first. Um, please. Wait for the mic, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Where is it? Sorry. <laughs> Director General, uh, Andy Matz from Department of Industry Science and Resources. Um, I think one of the uh, really interesting things about the changing geostrategic environment is that parts of the Australian government that have never been part of the traditional national security community all of a sudden find themselves in, in the front line managing some pretty manipulative, coercive um, activity. Uh, I guess my question for you is, how does your agency um, respond to that? Um, how, how is it that you provide support to those parts of, of the Australian government and adjust to, to the new normal? Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, well, I think I, you know, I sort of touched with COVID just as an exemplar of where all of a sudden um, we absolutely swung towards Department of Health and those departments that ordinarily don't get a lot of information from us, but their thirst and their need for knowledge about you know what was being put in the public domain and what the truth was, which comes back to you know the challenges of open source. 
uh, it was our job to ground truth that and the collection agencies were you know absolutely um, you know put our put our our sources uh, onto that particular challenge and we made sure that you know Brendan Murphy and the people that needed to know what we were obtaining uh, got that information so we can adapt very very quickly to whatever the priorities are um, and obviously Andrew and and I and the team in and I you know that was a central part of the reporting they did I, I think I mean there will always be challenges because some departments are better set up and I think what we have learnt more broadly and I know the demands on skiffs and I know the demands on vetting and all of that is just growing and growing and growing but that's the that's the nature of the world we're going to live in and the I think you know, in many respects, what we're dealing with, for example, in SCONS, the Secretary's Committee of National Security, is that intersection between um, intelligence, uh, national security policy, and economic policy. So, you know, we've talked about um, a whole range of, you know, issues that are bearing on the government, the calculations it needs to make about investments that's costing the taxpayer. Uh, in that, that economic security or economic investment space in our national interest. It's very hard to get the architecture right. I don't think any country has that architecture right of how you build that conversation across the board. And, and we're, it's been thought about. But more and more, I think, our conversations, there is that intersection between the sort of department that you're in, um, the sort of work that we do, and, and I think that's a work in progress. It, it's, it's inevitable that uh, the demands and the product is going and the intersection is only going to increase, not decrease. Yep. Thank you. Any more questions? I'll go to um, Dr. Will Stoltz from the National Security College. Thank you, Rory, and thank you, Paul. Um, Paul, you mentioned that the scope of what your agency's activities is is directly related to the risk appetite of politicians, primarily, I imagine, the Prime Minister and the, and the Foreign Minister. But it strikes me that the vocational background of those people is so starkly different to yours uh, and that, that <coughs> the world of, of ACES and the national intelligence community could appear to be quite esoteric to someone who's had a career as a union official or, or anything else that they're, they're coming to the role of prime minister or foreign minister as. So can you tell us a bit about how you and your counterpart agencies go about educating and preparing parliamentarians for interacting with your agencies and perhaps what more needs to be done to broaden the aperture of that risk appetite that you were mentioning before? Well, hopefully they read papers like yours, Will, that uh, <laughs> talks about uh, agencies like ours. Um, look, it's a really, um, it's a really interesting uh, challenge, actually, and I think um, those of us in the front row um, from the moment government was formed, if we use this year as an example, from the 21st of May, um, you know, the intensity of the briefings, of the, the issues that we need to impart um, on key ministers is, is, is very intense. And, you know, I guess we see it as a duty of us to, you know, impart that, that knowledge as rapidly as we can to help them. Um, but of course, they're dealing with a whole range of other issues. I think, um, I think the nature of the times is such that there is a genuine recognition that we have uh, something to offer. There's a lot that's going on, and if you've been out of if you've been out of power for a long time, there's a lot to catch up on. And you know, speaking very frankly, um, the sort of conversations that I think we've all been having has led to um, observations by ministers, which is sort of wow. I mean, you know. Uh, to a degree, a, a, a wow about the range of things that we do, the intensity of what's going on, um, and as you say, off the backdrop of what might be a, a union background or whatever. Um, so, and, and I think then it's really incumbent on us in the way we run our agencies is to build that trust and confidence very, very quickly. So I started right at the end about at the at the start, start at the start, start at the end, start at the start about. Um, um, being, being yourself, not being cavalier, um, making it very, very clear that you respect the Intelligence Services Act, that the governance and accountability that we carry as Director Generals to Parliament through the Parliamentary Joint Committee of Intelligence and Security, 
through the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, we take those really, really seriously. So there's a, so I think what we um, have done very well this year, I would say, is provide confidence about achieving outcomes that are high risk. It might often lead to a conversation which is, mm, Paul, I'm not so sure, uh, and we talk about it. And uh, it is all about trust. It's all about agencies, you know, delivering um, and delivering well, but reminding them that this is not a, a no-risk game. You know, we're engineered for risk, and really it's up to the government to decide what those risk settings are. Clearly, if we lived in Israel and I was the Director General of Mossad, the risk settings are very different. That's just the way it works. You know, if... if um, other countries have very different risk settings. So we'll be guided by that risk appetite, but that's a big part of the conversations we have in the early days with ministers is to sort of see where where it settles. Um, and I'd have to say, and this is a genuinely a non, uh, non-partisan comment, agencies like ours have benefited from both sides of politics and both sides of politics have benefited from us, the work that we do, and it's very much the way we go about it in building that confidence and that trust. Thanks, Paul. We're almost at time, but I have room for maybe one more question from the group. So if anyone has a question, and I think there we are, yes, in the middle, please. Um, thanks, Paul, for your time, and thanks, Rory, as well, for leading the discussion. Um, just a quick question. Can you, Paul, share on how you have observed diversity across your career within the national intelligence community, how that has developed and changed, any observations or maybe aha moments where you realise diversity would be a good thing? Um, and further, where and how future diversity can be encouraged across intelligence in Australia? Quick, quick personal journey. So when we were first employed by the government. We went to an all-male institution. I went from, on graduation for four years, I then went to a unit all-male. I then went to one job where there were a couple of women in the workplace, the vast majority male, and then for the successive postings after that, all-male. I mean, this was the army, you know, of, of the 80s. Um, contrast that with... Uh, My last three bosses have been Julie Bishop, Maurice Payne and Penny Wong. Guess what? I mean, uh, and and ACES as an organisation, in fact, the Defence Force recognised, I think, in the latter part of the 80s and through the 90s, that diversity is central to its capability. And I was part of that journey and I certainly, when I was Deputy Chief of Army, which Rory mentioned and the like, we were really pushing the envelope um, and... Uh, walking through with with Army, with leadership, uh, the fact that diversity was central to uh, the capability that the military have, and I think it's a great credit to the, the current generation of senior leaders in the uh, in the military. For, for for me in ASIS, it's it's a no brainer because uh, you know the, the most obvious point is that you should never be able to observe uh, you know what an who, who an ASIS officer is. Um, you know, whatever their background, that richness of diversity sits so centrally and comfortably in the way we are now and need to be into the future. Um, as a, as a, both the right thing to do, the best way to get capability, but also as a protective mechanism to make sure that um, no one sort of thinks, oh, well, it, that'll be ACES because, you know, they don't, they don't employ, you know, these people or whatever. So, um, we have really stepped up, um, I would say, um, there are some in the room but I won't identify because I can't identify them here, but really stepped up the, you know, and we've done this in the intelligence community more broadly, diversity and inclusion as a central pillar of the way we think, the way we act. I, I am dealing with certain committees inside uh, ASIS where the balance of diversity is not what we want, so we specifically... Uh, bring people in to ensure that the richness of the conversation in the, bo- in the board uh, reflects the richness that, that all board discussions have when you have that diversity, you know, that, that, that diversity in the committee. So I deliberately will bring people in, not because of the position they're in, but to make sure that I've got the right sort of voices in, in the board meeting. And we have benefited from that. I have benefited from that. There's no turning back as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to wrap up on, um, I think, uh, 
Another question that, that, that certainly reflects, uh, re reflects the, the challenges and the, the era that we live in, and that's about ethics. Um, so, you know, I guess at, at one level, there's something that is obviously ethically challenging about what ASIS does. You steal others' secrets. Um, at another level, though, I assume, I imagine that there are all sorts of processes for calculating the ethics of decisions when it comes to operations, whether it's to do with the, um, uh, you know, the the, um, the welfare of your of your people or looking after your agents or whatever it may be. Can you share anything with us about um, whether and how you, you foreground ethical questions when you're either uh, seeking ministerial authorisation um, for uh, activities or whether you're making those decisions internally? Do you have some sort of framework for processing that? Thanks, Rory. So, I mean, the, the central pillars of any submission that I put up to the minister, of which there are um, many, many every week, um, a lot of authorisations go to the Minister. Um, legality, propriety and risk are the central pillars that underpin every submission I write to the Foreign Minister. Uh, and so, you know, the legality is sort of fairly straightforward uh, and, you know, the guidebook is the Intelligence Services Act. Risk, pretty straightforward. You use uh, ISO 31000, which is the international standard for how to do risk management, and we use that and replicate that in great detail in our activities and the work that we do with the Foreign Minister and, and look at the, you know, the risks, the consequences, the likelihood, the normal sort of international standard of risk management. Propriety, though, is the issue uh, and the relationship bet between whether it's a proper activity, it's the proper thing to do, and people's ethical compass that's where the richness often in the workplace exists. Um, I brought in an ethics counsellor into uh, ASIS and that ethics counsellor was there that if anyone felt that they were going, had an ethical dilemma, they could put their, their hand up and they could talk to the ethic, ethics counsellor. Now, not so much in the last couple of years, but as my wife Kate knows, you know, the, the first couple of years in this job, the phone would often ring in the middle of the night because there were issues with in the Middle East with uh, communicating intelligence that might lead to kinetic uh, uh, action where I'd have to be woken in the middle of the night uh, and, and provide an authorisation. And so for some of our people that were caught in that targeting uh, chain, uh, ethical issues became a very, very prominent matter and that's why I brought an ethics counsellor in. I have said to the staff that if there's any un activity that they are developing or, or undertaking, and they have a personal ethical issue, firstly, they can put their hand up and they can say that they wish to opt out, and I guarantee them there will be no career detriment by putting up your hand and saying you have an ethical dilemma. But in return, I want them to have a conversation with the ethical counsel, you know, the ethics counsellor, who's been trained at the St James Ethics Centres and, you know, well grounded in, in contemporary ethics and, and historical ethics, and, and actually have a proper adult discussion about what is troubling you and trying to ground it in, you know, ethical discourse. So, interestingly, a number of people have put their hand up, no detriment to the career, put my hand up, I'll talk to the ethics counsellor, which is what I've asked them to do, and after a series of conversations have opted back in. So, it's uns so at the heart of your question is, this is not something that we can dismiss lightly. It is important in, in the human intelligence space. And I think in recognition of that, I've put those sort of processes in play. And I think with this thinking generation coming through, there's no turning back. It's, it's got to be available to people to have those sorts of conversations. Well, I, I know, Paul, that you, you feel that one or two of your answers were a little long, but that's the point. I think this has been a real masterclass for us. And I know that among the group in the room here, we have our Senior Executive Service course. Uh, this is day one um, of their four-week course. So it's perfectly timed that you've, um, uh, that you've chosen to speak with us today. You've accepted our uh, invitation. Um, my closing question is to you, what next? Kate, would you like the microphone? <laughs> 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 we're, we're, we're talking only a week or two away, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I've, I, um, b so uh, between mid-November when I start some leave and finish the job and mid-March when our son gets married to his fiancée, I'm doing nothing. I'm doing nothing. And 
Um, and I'm not proud of this, but I have never taken long service leave and, I've, um, and I have worked very hard. And I've worked hard in this job, so I'm being really frank. It's actually time to stop and do nothing for a while. So I'll do nothing. Uh, and then Kate knows me well enough to know, you know, come March, I'll, I'll get some itchy feet. Uh, and we'll see from we'll see from then. You know, it's it's not um, it's not zero miles an hour, but it's not hundred miles an hour. And I've just got to work out between them what the right speed is. Well, look, all I can say is thank you, Paul. I think on behalf of all of us, thank you for your service. Thank you, Kate, and, and your family and close friends for your service, really, in um, in in, in uh, supporting Paul through all these years. Thanks also for your support of the National Security College. I can't resist putting that plug in because uh, both through your support as uh, one of the agencies that supports our, our work, our, our participating agencies arrangement, but also the direct support through the, um, the scholarship that you and other uh, heads of the uh, intelligence agencies and acknowledge here today, uh, Andrew Shearer, Rachel Noble, and uh, uh, it's also good to see uh, Chris here representing, uh, rep representing Mike, uh, that's making a huge difference in building new generations of, of talent for the national security community. So thank you. Um, I'm not going to ask you to applaud yet because I'm going to hand back to my colleague uh, Nicola Rosenblum to close proceedings, uh, but just to say please stick around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. Paul, thank you very much. I mean, Rory has said it on, on behalf of the college. Thank you for your contribution of your very long and distinguished career. But I think um, I'd ask everyone here to thank Paul for his remarks this evening and to thank him very much for a, uh, a career of service. Thank you.